In ECW's history, there are only three men who held all three main championships, the television, tag and world titles. The second and third are names that most would likely guess, Sabu and Taz. You could also claim that Rob Van Dam is the fourth, but he won his world title in the WWE branded version, which went very well. This video is about none of these men, rather the first to achieve this honour, and for reasons I'll get to, the most unlikely of the four, Mikey Whipwreck. This video was originally going to be about one of Mikey's title wins, but the more I watched of him, the more I wanted to explore how he became one of ECW's most unlikely success stories. In WWE's Rise and Fall of ECW documentary, Paul Heyman introduced Mikey as a member of the ring crew who showed some promise. These kids worked on the ring crew for free as long as they could fly around the ring a little bit and just be noticed. Speaking on how they spotted Mikey in particular, Paul said he would take a bump and he had such sympathy. From here, Mikey would be trained and would wrestle his first televised match in January 94. A tag team lost to Kevin Sullivan and the Tasmaniac, who would go on to be Taz. Mikey would become a massively popular underdog with Paul, noting the one key was that we never gave him an offensive manoeuvre. If you're wondering, like I did, where the name Mikey Whipwreck comes from, Mikey himself said in an interview with Pro Wrestling Post that Heyman named him after a promoter from Maryland called Dennis Whipwreck. What Paul was doing in ECW at the time was, he was taking some of the job guys, taking a name and twisting it around a bit. I guess Paul was taking jabs at local promoters. There is, after all, a history of enhancement talent being given gimmick names, sometimes even taking shots at others in the business, such as famed WCW wrestler Randy Hogan. In the same interview, Mikey elaborates on what Heyman said in the WWE documentary. Mikey was training already with a friend who went by the name Stormin Norman, under WWE enhancement wrestler Sonny Blaze, but he never saw himself getting far in wrestling. I was 5 foot 8 or 9 inches tall and maybe 155 pounds. There was no chance in hell of someone my size doing anything in the business. He was charging me to wrestle if I cleaned the gym and things like that. Mikey goes on to explain that this would end up being his way into professional wrestling. ECW wanted to rent Sonny's ring, and I was pretty much the guy. So I went, and we'd set up. What's interesting though, is that both Mikey and Paul tell similar stories about Whipwreck being allowed to work in the ring, but the two accounts diverge from here. Paul tells the story of noticing a guy who showed that he could sell and draw sympathy even in practice, without a crowd, but Mikey tells it very differently. As soon as the ring was set up, he and I, referring to Norman, would do high spots to test the ring and the ropes are good, and that there weren't any bumps anywhere or overlapping pads. Things like that. I guess Joey Styles and Paul Heyman noticed me and asked me, do you want to wrestle? Mikey's also known for his rather unique ring gear, the biker shorts he claimed he borrowed from other wrestlers, initially at least, while his tennis shoes were all he had at the time. The oversized dragon shirt that would go on to inspire his look, he says just happened to be in his bag noting it was very much spur of the moment. Mikey would begin his ECW career with a five-month losing streak, eventually winning a few matches by DQ. His first real win came on May 13, 94, where he wouldn't just beat Pitbull number 1 Gary Wolf, but he would beat him for the ECW television title. Late in the match, Wolf hits a powerbomb on Mikey, clearly about to retain his belt, when the Tasmaniac hits the apron. Pitbull launches himself at Taz, only to get tangled in the ropes. From Wolf's selling, he rolls back into the ring, having appeared to have low-blowed himself on the rope. Commentator Jay Sully tells us that if a worthy opponent were in there, he might be able to take advantage of this. Seconds later, Mikey rolls over, barely covering Wolf, and the referee counts three, in what's portrayed as a very much accidental win for Whipwreck. Regardless, the ECW fans went wild as Mikey was awarded the TV Championship. The very next week's episode of ECW would begin with Mikey defending his newly won title against Kevin Sullivan. This fairly short match largely consists of Sullivan beating up Mikey, very quickly throwing him out of the ring, into the crowd and lobbing chairs at him. When the match finally gets in the ring, Kevin hangs Mikey upside down in the corner and repeatedly charges into him with knees. The third time he tries this, somehow the referee wanders in front and Sullivan knocks him down, causing Mikey to win the match by DQ. In this entire match, Mikey does not land so much as a single punch on the way to his dubious victory. Over the next several weeks, 
Mikey would continue to just barely hold on to his championship in the unlikeliest of ways. He would defeat Pitbull Gary Wolf again when Wolf refused to let go of his full Nelson, thus the referee overturning his decision, awarding the win to Mikey by DQ. Next he would defeat the returning Anthony Durante, more famously known as Pitbull No. 2, who hadn't been in ECW since 92. Mikey would slap their manager Jason Knight off the apron, enraging Wolf, who enters the ring and both Pitbulls attack Mikey, leading to another DQ win. After this, Mikey would defeat somebody he would feud with later on, the Sandman, again by DQ when Tommy Cairo, who Sandman was feuding with, would attack both men with a cane. The referee sees Cairo hit Mikey first, and so yet again Mikey retains by DQ. If you keep in count, this is the fourth sort of successful title defence, but surely Mikey's luck would run out soon. On the following week's episode, Sandman would get a rematch. This would come to another short end, as Mikey on the outside would accidentally bump into Woman, the Sandman's manager, and she would enter the ring and hit him with a cane repeatedly. Several wrestlers would attempt to save Mikey as Sandman goes off with the cane, but they all get flawed. Finally, Tommy Dreamer would come to the rescue, whose own history with Sandman and a cane is a whole other story. In his next match, Mikey would defeat Stevie Richards, and though this time it looked like Mikey might actually win by himself, given that the young Stevie Richards was more on his own level, Jason Knight would run in, attacking Mikey, giving him another DQ win. This would lead to Mikey's next title defence against Jason at Hardcore Heaven. Forgive me for making an irrelevant side note here, but while watching this match I couldn't help noticing that despite the match taking place in Gilbertsville, Pennsylvania, the ring mat displayed the logo of the famous New York nightclub, Studio 54. In Paul Heyman's 2014 WWE documentary, he talks about how he'd worked as a photographer and a promoter there in the 80s, even hosting a wrestling-themed event there on August 23, 1985, using the contacts that he'd made as a photographer for wrestling. The event that is essentially Paul's debut as a promoter featured the presentation of a Man of the Year award to Ric Flair, an honour Heyman made up just to get him to attend, as well as the pro wrestling debut of one of Paul's future ECW world champions, Bam Bam Bigelow. At Hardcore Heaven, Mikey would finally lose the television title to Jason Knight, where a stipulation was added that the match couldn't end in disqualification. This quickly becomes Mikey's best effort yet, as he quickly strings together a crossbody, an atomic drop, a drop kick, a hip toss, an arm drag, a body slam, and ends with a second drop kick, while the crowd get louder and louder. After weeks and weeks of seeing Mikey get beaten up mercilessly, this felt like an earned moment where the ECW fans showed their support of Mikey. Had the crowd not got behind him, none of this would have hit quite like it did. While this is certainly a high point, the end of the match would create much confusion. Mikey would swing a chair, missing Jason but clocking the referee. And when hitting Jason, Mikey would pin him and the referee would slowly crawl over and count three. While Mikey's celebrating, the Pitbulls run in and attack him and pull Jason over him, and the referee counts three a second time, awarding the match and the title to Jason. The story they were trying to tell is that the referee was groggy and didn't recall counting the first fall, and had never called for the bell. Regardless, Mikey would move into a very unlikely chapter in his career and his very next match. Over the years, wrestling has seen many a tag team made up of two people you couldn't imagine coexisting in the same room together, let alone in a wrestling ring. Some have even become champions, with two famous examples being Team Hell No, or a bit further back than that, Goldust and Booker T. In both of those examples, the members would eventually end up a unified team, but what happens when one half seemingly has no control over the situation he finds himself in? On August 27th, 1994, ECW Tag Team Champions The Public Enemy were scheduled to defend their titles against Cactus Jack and Terry Funk. But Terry apparently didn't make it to the event, with Joey Styles claiming that Funk had plane trouble. This left Cactus with a big problem. Who would he be able to find as a replacement partner? It's also worth noting that following this match, Shane Douglas in the main event would win the NWA World Championship and throw it to the ground post-match. The tag title match would air on television on the following week though, which would be the first official episode of the newly renamed Extreme Championship Wrestling. For more information on that, I have a video about Shane's actions that night on this channel. 
Eastern Championship Wrestling before this had been crossing the line for a fair while. For example, at Heatwave 94 one month previously, the Public Enemy achieved maybe their biggest victory ever, defeating Terry and Dory Funk Jr., both former NWA World Champions, in a barbed wire rope match. This match actually predates the more famous Funk vs Sabu barbed wire match, which happened in 1997. Around this time in 94, at Hardcore Heaven was the infamous night where Terry Funk, while in a match with Cactus Jack, requested that a fan throw him a chair. He got a lot more than a chair, as the ECW Arena fans threw a barrage of chairs into the ring. This would become one of the most iconic clips of ECW footage ever. On the September 6, 94 episode of Hardcore TV, as we wait to find out who will walk through the curtain, Joey Styles asks us, Which world-class athlete? Which former world champion, which legend, which tough guy will Cactus pick as his partner? As it turns out, Cactus would pick none of these, a very unlikely partner to say the least. Cactus would emerge through the curtain, presumably grabbing the first wrestler he saw backstage, a very, very reluctant Mikey Whipwreck, who was actively resisting Jack pulling him towards ringside. Mikey even almost escapes at one point, making it clear he does not want to fight the public enemy and Cactus has to throw him into the ring just to get the match started. Even as Mikey is introduced by ring announcer Bob Ortiz, he has a look on his face like he'd rather be anywhere else in the world. Despite this, Cactus would insist that Mikey starts the match, but as soon as Rocco Rock approaches him, Mikey again tries to dive out of the ring, only for Cactus to catch him. He again begs Cactus, who shows some remorse and tags in to start the match. Not knowing what's coming, you might be forgiven for thinking this serves Foley right for picking the wrong partner, but moments later, Mikey returns with a weapon, and the crowd loves him for it. From here, the match finally starts, and as you can imagine, it's no technical classic. Cactus would use Mikey as a battering ram, maybe the most offense Mikey was a part of, sort of a part of. What follows next is several minutes of Public Enemy beating down Whipwreck, who kicks out of everything they have, including pile drivers. In the end, Cactus would create a distraction by knocking Rocco off the top rope. Mikey would roll him up for a shock victory. Not only did Cactus and Whipwreck win the tag titles, but they overcame the odds to do it. Unlike his TV title reign, what really made Mikey and Cactus winning the ECW tag titles memorable wasn't the matches themselves, it was the promos that really built the character of Mikey Whipwreck. In the next segment post the two winning the belts, Cactus essentially interviews Mikey, who noted that he had promised his mother that he wouldn't win another championship because, quote, she's scared I'm going to end up like you. In response, Foley points out that he could have picked anyone out as his partner, but he chose Mikey, because he saw something in the young Whipwreck. But he did his best to both gas up and frighten Mikey, and it's clear that this would be a hell of a ride. Over the next several weeks of ECW television, Cactus would continue to alert Mikey to the fact that the public enemy were out for their blood, and Mikey would attempt to run away several more times, making him feel more like a hostage than an ECW champion. On the September 20th episode, Cactus goes into a long rant about how he's faced many wrestlers who were angry at him, listing Sting and Abdullah the Butcher among others, and claims that they all left a scar on him that he wears with pride. This is somehow supposed to inspire Mikey, but only further intimidates him. Cactus would ask Mikey what all of this means, to which Mikey would timidly respond, it means I'm gonna die. Rather than caring for him, the unhinged Cactus Jack would yell at us that he likes it, Mikey really likes it. From the look on Mikey's face, he really didn't like it. On Mick's podcast, Foley is Pod, when asked about his dynamic when teaming with Mikey, Foley said, I loved it because he took such great bumps. He had sympathy with the fans, and this was, generally speaking, a pretty unsympathetic group of die-hard fans. He then calls their time together a big brother type of relationship, noting that Mikey would sometimes stay the night on his way home after ECW cards. Cactus and Mikey's tag title reign would be fairly short-lived. At November to remember 1994, the duo would lose the belts back to the public enemy. The match had a fairly unique stipulation to it, where the baseball bats that the public enemy carried to the ring weren't legal unless a member of the other team had failed to meet a 10 count, last man standing style. But the winners would still be determined by pin. Whether these unusual rules had a purpose or not. Another unusual thing was that Mikey was clearly hesitant, but he actually chose to start the match off for his team. Perhaps the words of Cactus Jack had been giving some encouragement after all. While Cactus and Mikey farewell to start off with, 
The match takes a turn when Cactus gets powder thrown into his eyes, leading him to accidentally hit a DDT on Mikey that he does not beat the 10 count from. By the time Cactus realises what's happened, he tries to pick Mikey up but it's too late, and now Public Enemy are allowed to use the bats, as Johnny Grunge would use it on Mikey to get the pin and reclaim the tag team titles. While Mikey and Cactus's reign wasn't the most special from an in-ring perspective, it's clear that the Mikey Whipwreck that actively ran away from the public enemy just a few months earlier was gone, and he would move on to bigger things in 1995. From here, Mikey Whipwreck's career would only gain more accolades. He would have a second tag title run with Cactus Jack and a very short second TV title reign. But before those, on the October 31st 95 episode of Hardcore TV, Mikey would challenge the Sandman to a ladder match for the ECW World Championship. At the start of this episode, Joey Styles makes it clear that this won't be like any other ladder matches we're used to, where the belt is suspended above the ring. Rather, the match would end by pinfall. Quote, the way championship should be won. Whether this is a dig at something WWE or WCW had done around this time, I'm not sure, but I'm betting it probably was. Halfway through the episode, we see Mikey in the pitch black with his former foes, the Public Enemy. We're told that they're in Central Park, but we have no real way of knowing this, as Public Enemy try to motivate Mikey ahead of his match with the Sandman. As Rocco leaves for supplies, this devolves into a comedy sketch, where Johnny Grunge has Mikey dashing up a ladder to retrieve beers for him. I should point out here that this episode in particular has a lot of comedy in it. The show opens with the infamous Steve Austin Monday NyQuil skit, where Austin parodies Eric Bischoff and WCW Nitro in general in a rather hilarious rant. We're also introduced to a bizarre segment called Extreme Encyclopedia, consisting of the screens you're seeing right now, set to classical music. After this training montage of sorts, we cut to the Sandman making his entrance, with Woman holding on to the ECW gold. Given that the last match I talked about in this video was almost a year ago, it shouldn't be surprising that we see a very different Mikey Whipwreck than the man who against his will teamed with Cactus Jack, and seemingly by pure luck held on to the TV title. This is a Mikey with a little more confidence about him. The Sandman doesn't care though, flicking his cigarette at him while perched from the top of the ladder. Before the match can begin, we get an entrance from the extreme superstar, Steve Austin, who climbs the ladder and cuts a scathing promo on All in the Ring, and challenges the winner. On his way out of the ECW arena, he carries Woman away so she can't get involved in the match. Though Mikey does get to use the ladder as a weapon early on, this match is mostly all Sandman on the attack. He brutally slams Mikey onto a ladder, and later props him up on the ladder and hits a leg drop off it. A fan hands Mikey a chair, which allows him to come back. Sandman then does an insane move where he leaps from the ring to the floor, catapulting the ladder which is propped over the guardrail into Mikey, who is in the crowd. If you've ever seen the infamous ladder match between Sandman and Sabu, we're reaching those levels of recklessness. Mikey hits a splash into the ladder laid on Sandman, and actually gets a three count. Joey Styles asks us, do you believe in miracles? As the man who was afraid of his own shadow not that long ago, becomes only the third world champion since the company became Extreme Championship Wrestling, joining the Sandman and Shane Douglas. At 95's November to Remember, which aired on TV on November 21st, but was taped after Mikey's next match, Mikey would have the match many people probably know him for, but less might have actually seen as he would defend the ECW world title against Steve Austin. The match was actually scheduled to be the Sandman getting another rematch against Mikey, but he would be brutally attacked in the entranceway by Austin, causing the match to be changed. As Sandman is taken away by EMTs, Mikey comes out to accept the challenge laid out by Austin. As Mikey walks to the ring, Joey Styles lists all of Austin's WCW accomplishments, noting that the world title so far had eluded him, which is a weird thing to hear all these years and several WWE championships later. Austin ends his promo on Mikey with a pretty epic line, My name is Steve Austin, and for tonight, for a very, very short while, your name is Eric Bischoff. Honestly, Steve Austin's time in ECW is worthy of its own deep dive, but for now, I'll point out that eight years later, Austin would finally get his hands on Eric in a ring at No Way Out 2003 but for now he would have to settle for taking his frustration out on Mikey Whipwreck. In what felt like a rerun of Mikey's TV title days, 
Steve Austin would beat on the champion mercilessly, even at one point mocking one of his targets in WCW, Hollywood Hogan, by hitting the big boot and leg drop, with Joey Styles noting that that stuff doesn't work around here. Mikey would try and fight back, but Austin would hit his finisher before the stunner, known as the stun gun, where he would drop his opponent across the top rope. Mikey would, shockingly, kick out of this move. In my near 25 years of watching wrestling, I don't believe I've ever seen this anywhere else, but Mikey would actually pin Steve Austin with, of all moves, a sunset flip. Granted, he was pulling on Austin's tights so much that ECW, or maybe just the WWE Network, had to pixelate parts of him, but a win is a win, and Mikey forever has one over the extreme superstar. Austin would attack Mikey post-match, and the story between the two wouldn't end here but this likely remains the trivia note that most people know about Mikey Whipwreck. On the following week's Hardcore TV, Mikey would defend his world title again, this time against, of all people, Rey Mysterio Jr., who was nearing the end of his time in the company. Sadly, they only presented this match in clip form, but they made it look like a belter of a match, with Mikey getting a fair amount of offense in, in a match where he would uniquely have the size advantage. Mikey would win with a maestral cradle, and the two would show respect to each other post-match. On the December 12th episode of Hardcore TV, Mikey's world title reign would come to an end, as he would face the Sandman and Steve Austin in what they were billing as a triangle match. The match starts with Steve and Mikey, with Austin noticeably taking the champion much more seriously. The two have a very sporting wrestling match until Mikey attempts another sunset flip, and the Sandman's music hits. While there are several minutes of Steve Austin and Sandman going at each other, in the closest thing they had to a singles match. Mikey would also get a lot more in than I've seen in any other match for this video. In ECW three-way tradition, Mikey would be eliminated first by Steve Austin following a stun gun, guaranteeing a new champion, who would end up being the Sandman. Mikey's triple crown would end here, but what a journey we've covered, from a man who couldn't even get a punch in, to an ECW world champion fighting on the same level as future legends of wrestling. So what of the rest of Mikey Whitwreck's career? Briefly, as I'm aware this video is getting pretty long. In 99, Mikey would join WCW, and have not that great a run. But to be fair, not many people did in 99. He would debut in what fans at the time called one of the better matches of the uncensored pay-per-view on March 14th, where he would lose to WCW Cruiserweight Champion Billy Kidman. Throughout the year, he would wrestle 12 more matches in WCW, losing all but two, and they were for the lower level B shows worldwide and Saturday night. Wrestling his final WCW match in August, he would be back in ECW by October, where he would stay until the end of the promotion. Upon his return, he would form a tag team with Yoshihiro Tajiri, known as the Unholy Alliance, led by the Sinister Minister, more known today as Father James Mitchell from TNA and that weird NWA white powder incident. He continued to work the indies after ECW closed, and would later find new footing as a trainer. Some of the wrestlers he's been credited for training include, but aren't limited to, former Ring of Honor World Champion Jay Lethal, Matt Cardona, formerly known as Zack Ryder, and WWE and AEW wrestler Trent Beretta. In a 2018 interview with Wrestling Inc., Mikey noted that he turned down one of the more notable of the many ECW tribute shows and reunions, TNA's Hardcore Justice event. He elaborated on how he felt that one night stand was more authentic because it was held in an ECW building and Paul Heyman was there, but TNA's later attempts just didn't feel right to him. He did however work Shane Douglas' initial hardcore homecoming event that was created to counter WWE one night stand, but he didn't wrestle on any of the follow up events. In the same interview, Mikey claims that he's also turned down a job as a trainer for NXT around 2018, arguably during their peak years. Mikey notes that he declined the offer because he didn't want to move his family down to Florida for fear of being fired and ending up unemployed in a new home, but he would have accepted guest trainer spots, which NXT also does from time to time. Incidentally, this exact situation would happen to Alison Danger, a former wrestler who is the sister of ECW alumni and current WWE employee Steve Carino. On January 5th, 2022, Having uprooted her family from Las Vegas to move to Florida, WWE released her on the day she was picking up her children for their first day at their new school. In her words on Renee Paquette's podcast, I feel like I got brought to Florida and left to die. In 2021, 
Mikey announced that he would be backing away from public appearances, citing his family, even noting, I've had enough of my kids crying when I pack a bag. He then further explained issues he was having mentally, including, quote, crippling social anxiety, hearing loss, confusion, mood swings, and problems getting his words out. Mikey goes on to note that through his career, he suffered 14 concussions that he's aware of, noting that these might be the cause of the issues. As of me making this video, Mikey is still a semi-active professional wrestler, with his latest match being for New York Wrestling Connection on January 20th, 2024, a promotion he's had history with since 2003. On January 3rd of this year, Mikey on Twitter posted a sobering account of his experiences with post-concussion syndrome, describing his ailment as feeling like my brain is underwater. Combined with the near constant headache behind my eyes, it means a day of wishing it was over on and off all day. Lifetime of post-concussion syndrome makes for a lovely existence. I hope you'll forgive me for changing the tone, but I originally set out to make this video about a fun story in ECW history, but my further research led me just to a different ending. When Mikey tweeted about his current issues, he received a barrage of well wishes from fans, which brings some relief. I want to end this video by wishing all the best to Mikey, and I hope you do too. Thank you for watching yet another wrestling channel. If you enjoyed this, please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, or even subscribing. 